it's Joe, and welcome to another episode of the Test Guild Automation Podcast. Today, we'll talk to Melissa all about QA, automation, probably robotics, AI. Who knows? She has a lot of experience, so we're going to be diving deep. If you don't know, Lissette is a passionate quality engineer leader. She has over 18 years of experience helping people and companies improving the quality of their applications uh, with solid tools. She has a simple process she follows, and she also knows how to create a really smart team around her. She's also responsible for leading and managing high-performing quality testing teams throughout all phases of the software development testing cycle, ensuring that all the information systems, products, and services meet or exceed organizations and industry quality standards, as well as end user requirements, which we know is so important nowadays. This includes establishing and maintaining the QA strategy, process, platforms, and resources needed to deliver 24-7 operation critical solutions for many of the world's largest companies. I met her at Star West. She told me all about the awesome things she's doing there. She's also a proven leader that thrives in a high quality, high technical software development environment. Really excited to have her on the show today. You don't want to miss it. Check it out. Hey, Lisette, welcome to the Guild. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So excited to be here. I've been a listener. I was excited to see you at Star Wars, and I'm happy that we made it happen today in 2020, 2023. Absolutely. Yeah, really excited. Uh, after I met you, I'm like, oh, I have to get you on the show because it sounds like you're really, really doing a lot of cool things there. So I thought maybe that's, we'll start with that. It sounds like um, you're working in a robotics um, industry. So maybe you could talk maybe a little bit like what, what your current uh, testing needs are and maybe some challenges that you're, you're dealing with that maybe other people aren't, especially when it comes to maybe robotics. Yeah, challenge, definitely. And <laughs> I love challenge and that's why I took on the role. I've been at photo robotic for about six months now and uh, what we're doing is uh, at least what attracted me to this role and the challenge that we have is really uh, serving our robotic and autonomous machine customer so we have a set of tools that are a really a, comp a, a combination of a uh, hardware uh, firmware and also software and cloud-based application and eventually in the future mobile application. So you can see that we're hitting all this part and my team is responsible of managing and leading uh, um, all the QA testing and quality effort in that organization. Very cool. So I, you're known for process, uh, implementing processes. So I'm just curious to know, like you're dealing with firmware. It seems like you're dealing with a lot of moving parts there. So how do you implement a QA automation strategy or process within this company? Yes, so that's, so that's the challenge. And uh, I I was attracted to it because uh, in the past, I've worked in hardware company, just dealing with hardware alone, uh, cloud-based company, and then software. So this is the first time that I'm in a, a startup where all of these are a good challenge to have, right? And the way I'm approaching it is really from one area to another, while I'm also keeping a consistent process across the organization. For me, it's really about simplicity, simplicity. Simplicity, having simple process, understanding each, need, each team needs and trying to meet them where they are so that we can solve the challenge. Let it be in the hardware team, let it be on our firmware, but also be the one that allow each team to cross collaborate. So one of my favorite words of this year is like cross pollination so that every team is collaborating because I feel like the more we collaborate, you know, in our test strategy in through our automation, we are able to find those edge case bugs that really, you know, kind of like um, drive us not toward the end of our implementation. And that's exactly where we are right now <laughs> in our challenge. So how do you do that cross pollination then? Cause I know uh, to try to get everyone together on the same page is difficult. How do you get people to actually contribute and say, Oh, get, get kind of excited about this. Yeah, that's the, 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 that is a challenge totally. And we love to do that. But uh, what I, what I've implemented, I've implemented this in the past. I usually like to call QA folks. I see QA folks, people, people that wear that hat, you know, as agent, agent of change. That's really what they're doing on a daily basis. And I even like to call them FBI agent of change sometime, right? Because if you add the FBI, you have a little bit of the investigation, trying to really crawl and find out what's the issue. So I'm using my team to really be at the center of that between dev, DevOps, automation engineer, and other, other needs. 
to be able to really find what is the issue and then how do we add that to our really test uh, suit so that, you know, not only we're thinking about the problem of today, but how do we resolve it so that we get ahead of the issue? Because as a process person, I'm always trying to like sit and understand the challenge, the pain point that occur now and how do we add that into the loop so that we get ahead of it early in the cycle next time. Because for a startup, there's a really fast change happening all the time, right? So you really have to be uh, cognizant of that, but also make sure that when you start a new process, you can work. And it, that means working with product team, working with our developer, which has various type of developer. You know, we have our cloud developer, we have our firmware developer, embedded system developer, you know. So each of these people have a specialty, right? And QA cross it cut it uh, cut across all of them so making sure that you know you really go and understand each of them challenge resolve that but make sure that it's consistent across so that what we learn from one team we can also apply in another team because everybody does not have the same challenge at the same time some and every team at the different maturity level as well because that's another thing that is cognizant for me so when we learn one challenge, I try to document it. I try to keep track of it so that as long as another team has it, we can solve it for them either in the same way or in different ways. Yeah, we think challenges around firmware are much different than uh, the cloud team. Yes. So um, how much automation do you put into place and how do you know like automation can be applied to firmware? Because it's not like you're, you're using Selenium or gets a browser no, no. application. So how do you know like, all right, I know automation is, is helpful and it has to be able to be helpful in firmware, but maybe some teams don't know how to do that. How do you know what's automatable, I guess, or yeah, that's how good, you can help teams? Yeah, that, that's, the, that, that's a good question. One is to really understand what they're doing, you know, like at a very granular level. And in my mind, I just had that conversation today with my team is, you know, I have this funnel in my head, right? It's like anything that is close to the code is really easy to automate, right? So from a firmware perspective, you know, unit testing, we've, this year we've invested, or last year, we've invested a lot in our unit testing because those were like the low hanging fruit. And we've seen effort being around that really helping us a lot. So now the next stage of that is what kind of integration, not far from the firmware that we can do, you know? And sometimes the hardware can become like a super black box to us so we try and is really trying to like chip away at it from the middle layer as much as possible if you think of the hardware being lower the next middle layer and it's the same thing also on the cloud team you know trying to chip away at it from the api layer as much as possible and see how many tests can we focus in on and then the other area that are not that that could be a challenge or that are much uh adapt to flux because hardware can be a huge problem right like we we have to make change in our hardware sometimes frequently sometimes because of a bug that happened in, in manufacturing so we leave that alone but the next layer is where our focus is and we can run repeatable tests so we can easily identify issue so those are kind of like the work that i have to lean in with each team and understand how we can help them yep so, so that's interesting. Also, that's probably another challenge. Uh, you're dealing, uh, uh, testing against hardware. So it's not like you can go against a browser and just spin them up. And so how, how do you handle that then? Do you have bottlenecks where you can only do so much testing because you're tied to maybe a, a, um, an environment with that has the hardware you need and you can't just easily? Yep. No, replicate it yeah so we that's that's a good question we we use simulator some places you know a couple of our team use simulator so but even we use simulator that's just in uh doing testing sometimes we use that as a early testing methodology just to get a sense of like where we are just to even understand how our test is solid you know but then at the end test in the true value of tests and just not to throw another range Another challenge that my team is focusing on is really in our organization, it's safety and security, you know. So we have a lot of safety standards that we have to follow. So our final test to meet our safety certification and all that also have to run, you know, on a, uh, in the real hardware. And the latest version is possible before we can certify ourselves as well. So there's a, there's a really granular level that we have to go through, but we've, we, we've used some uh, simulator as well as early tests to just get a sense of how our tests are, just testing our own tests pretty much with, with, the, with the simulator. And then we run it on the real hardware as well. And the, based on the hardware revision, we got to keep keep pace of that too, because if our hardware team make a change, 
in our um, hardware revision, we got to, you know, make sure that we also run our latest tests on those. A lot of moving parts. Yeah. And then you add security on top of it. So, you know, you say your QA is like QA agents have changed and they go across all across the, the different verticals, I guess. Are they responsible for everything? Like, do you expect your QA person to actually know security or do you have people embedded that experts in it? Like, how does that work? Because it sounds like you're trying to cover a lot of different, yes, different yes, things. Yes, yes, yes. So when we hire, I mean, that, that, that's a good question because that's a challenge that I was facing last year when I was hiring folks, right? Because for us, security and safety is our product, you know? That's part of our product. So we have some security expert, you know, developer and architect that are really architecting how security should be building into our hardware and our firmware and also, you know, in our cloud application throughout the whole product uh, uh, pipeline, right? So from a QA perspective, you don't have to know security, but if you know security is a good thing, you know? So we look at it as part of the product. So you just go, you need to understand the requirement and you test in uh, for security, you know? And it's a little bit more granular for us because it's like secure boot, you know? Our hardware need to be secure boot. We need to have secure updates. So those are like functionality that we are selling out there. And these are part of our functionality. So we need to understand that. So we are building a team that will be, you know, world-class uh, on the, that understand cybersecurity and also safety as well. So how do you get, how do you know you're doing the right things then? Do you have uh, <laughs> any metrics you use to know, okay, yes. with security, we're doing this. I have a, do you have a, like, how do you keep track of all this, all this stuff? <laughs> yes. Yes. So I'm a huge fan of dashboard, you know, and we are definitely work in progress. And uh, dashboard is like uh, an area of my responsibility, actually, because I like a dashboard. I like to know what is the KPIs, you know, are we meeting the KPI? So each of our products has some KPI that they need to meet. We also have KPI for the software team. You know, we have KPI for quality team and we have KPI for our hardware team, you know, even in, in terms of like how um, our customer, I mean, our manufacturer, they produce the hardware that comes into our organization or even that goes to our customer. So we need KPI across all that. So that's how we, we are. Right now we are defining the KPI and then uh, next we'll try to like make sure that we have a baseline and then try to improve upon those data that we, we collect. From each release. All right. So it sounds like you have a, a team also that is distributed. So is yes. everyone in house or, or are they all over the world? Like, how do you, how do you deal with not only all this technology, but it sounds like I think you have resources all over the world as well. Yes. It's not a huge organization, but uh, it's very an efficient team. And we are definitely all over the world. It's a mixed bag of uh, in-house. Most of our hardware folks are in-house in Philadelphia, you know, in the lab on hands. And then we have teams that are across in the United States. And then they we first come in the lab as needed. So it's also that mixed bag that we have totally. So how did you set that up? Because I, I believe you, you built this organization. It was a startup. You helped build it from the ground up or you have experience doing that. Yeah. How do you know when it makes sense to have someone in-house as opposed to, all right, this makes sense to, uh, yes. even to tell management, look, this person's great. They're not going to be, I know we, you know, that they're distributed, but they could still work remotely and get, get the job done. Yeah. I love that question. Cause that was something that I had to like finally clearly define, you know, and although I've done this in multiple organizations in the past, I've been working with distributed team for the past 10 to 11 years, actually 12 years since I was at Yahoo. So that is not, I've used to work with teams that are like geographically diverse, India, uh, California, Texas, and also uh, in New Zealand, you know? So I had like all those time zones. So I'm kind of used to that, but it just requires a little bit more of like flexibility and agility among the team and a lot of collaboration. But to your point, what I have found out and have decided and learned on, you know, as we try is um, the most experienced team member can be remote, meaning people that have like a lot of experience, you know, they're more independent, you know, they're more flexible, they're more agile. Those are the senior role, senior engineer, they can be remote. And uh, it has worked so far because they are more responsible, for lack of a better word. They have a lot of accountability and then they travel as needed to, to a, a headquarter in Philadelphia. Uh, the folks that are a little bit more, I would say, junior or with less experience, even with the tool and technology and even our hardware, we love for them to be local because then they get to like learn a lot more about the uh, our hardware and play with it, you know, because uh, we all like uh, 
little kids that love to play with those hardware, right? So if they're more local or really close to the headquarter, they can go in office as often as possible because you learn by doing a lot more. And then you can collaborate with other folks in the lab. So that's the combination that have worked for me so far. How do you get people on board? Uh, do you have a training uh, system in place uh, to help them? Because like, like I said, it doesn't seem like a standard b- web browser type situation. Yes. So yes. how do you know, like how's your onboarding then that, that you're planning? Yes, uh, that was also another area that I had to tackle last year because, I mean, f- uh, hiring, it takes time. You know, you have to go through all that process, finding the right talent, which was not easy, you know, because it, you can see all the combination that you need, right? You know, if they have security, yes. If they have safety, that's even great. They need to have uh, embedded. So that was, a, that was a good challenge that we, we were able We had some great folks that joined the team. And then the next plan for me was let's plan the, a great onboarding for them, right? And for me, I feel like onboarding is probably never ending. But uh, uh, the great thing that we have at Ford Robotic, we have an excellent team that is really great at collaboration. For me, it starts with documenting our onboarding, right? So the first, I would say, first month is really intensive meeting with various folks you know and just having detailed conversation about what they do so the team understand how they fit in the whole landscape from product all the way to our uh, integration team meaning like our operation you know production team so they have to meet with all those folks on a regular basis we have a roadmap conversation so they know you know what product they're working on what are the features of those products and then get into like tools and technology that they need to learn you know, so there's really different layers for that. So that that is like a long month. And then that, that doesn't stop, right? I do a, a continuous uh, conversation with them. We create, we have a customer team, a fabulous, they have great um, uh, customer training, you know, because you have to learn about um, another part of our tool is it's used in a variety of organizations. So we have agriculture, we have a uh, um, tele. Uh, communication meaning like um uh autonomous driving we have uh, manufacturing we have construction you know we have like a wide range of industry and each industry have different use case as well so our sales and customer team has done a great job like creating various training and when you go through those training you really give you a great sense of like what is our product and how they use our product out there because i feel like keyword folks also need to have that lens right to understand how, because sometimes you can get too much in the weed of like your daily testing and you lose sight of actually the customer uh, part of it. So that training also happened. It's part of the onboarding and that is a long process as well. And we're still refining our uh, onboarding. But so far, you know, we're getting feedback from uh, these uh, these folks so we can refine it so that when we have future of hire, we can also, you know, make sure it's, 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 it's work well for them. But onboarding for me, it's super, it's critical. So uh, these these uh, questions just coming into my head. And when I, <laughs> um, how about tooling? Because like once again, it seems like uh, are you creating your own tools? Are you are you purchasing tools? Are they open source? How does that work? It's it's a mixed bag, and uh, I have to tell you that uh, tools is something that we're gonna focus more on this year. You know, because we're really trying to get our product complete and ready in the market for general availability because most of our product has been used by early adapter, early user to give us feedback. So we, we are really focusing on having our general availability product out there. We do, you're talking about internal tool for us, right? We have a couple of tools, but they're not consistent across team as we want to. We use Py, uh, PyTest, you know, for some of our automation. We've used in a, a, a Cypress. I just had talked to my team today that we might dabble into a little bit of selenium and even play right. So we're really trying to, uh, I'm personally somebody that is super tool agnostic because, you know, I've used so many tools in my almost uh, two decade career that, you know, I don't get really married to a tool much. I have like a whole speech that I do about, you know, picking your tool is almost like dating. So I'm really open and tool agnostic. I actually let the team select the tool that work for them right and just tell me what so this year but we're going to get a little bit more clean up and align on our tool across the organization because that's also important for us and uh, as we growing and expanding and scaling we want to really get that consistent as well i love that approach don't fall in love with tools use the <laughs> tool that's right for you and your team if it works for you great if it doesn't move on yes for sure um 
So, no, at Star West, I, I think you were on a panel on AI and testing with Tyreek. Yes. So, does AI come into play at all in your current job? Like, do you actually use AI and testing? Where does the AI piece come yes. in? Or is it just something you got from another another company? Another company, yes. So, not yet at uh, Fort Robotic, but I would like to bring it. But um, I wasn't, yes, you, you actually recall. I was on the panel to talk about AI because in... Um, since 2016, I have been involved, you know, with, um, I was working in an organization where we had a lot of testing to be done with a very small team again, right? So I was really trying to find the, 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 the right solution. And again, me being somebody that is a super tool agnostic, you know, I went on the marketplace and I was an early adopter of an, an AI-based tool that my team used super successfully, you know. So I have that case study that I really shared during the uh, the conference about how we had like all, almost thousand test cases and the process that we went through using an AI based tool with a team that was not um, automation engineer but, uh, from the strat, right? They learn as the, the tool allowed them to become automation engineer in the span of less than a six month and how we were able to like reduce uh, uh, um, our efficiency. I mean, actually increase our efficiency by reducing the time we were spending, you know, going from like three hours running our regression. I mean, no, three days running regression to like three hours, you know, so that was a huge efficiency. So from that moment, I got in, I was in love with uh, AI. I've been involved with AI from graduate school way back then, you know, and I've always been a fan of understanding how we can use AI based tests to help, uh, you know, Kiwi. So that is something that I'm passionate about. I'm actually starting a, a course uh, in a few weeks in February, in two weeks, actually, just teaching at um, quality and then artificial intelligence, because I feel like there's a good uh, correlation. I just have a lot of challenge right now in my current organization before we can introduce that because I need I, we need to get a strong baseline, you know, into how we automating things before we get to that next layer. I need to get you back on the show dedicated just to that. <laughs> so I guess at a high level then, uh, what should someone as a tester know, need to know about AI? Is it just they need to know, like, do they really need to get in the guts of it? Like, like at high level, if there was a syllabus, like what, what would they need to know about AI in order to be successful with it in testing, if anything? Yeah, for me, I feel like depending on the level, right, because you ask the right question, how deep do you want to get into it? The team that I was with, and I do talk about that in my talk, right, it's all depend. You don't want to get deep like me or deep like my friend Tariq King, you know, level. But, you know, some of us are just geeking out about it a lot more. But depending on your interest, just, I, I, my talk is usually about be aware that it can help you, you know, and, and I have refined my talk from 2019 to even now 2023, because back in 20, I would say 19, people were still a little bit reluctant when you say AI and then you say keyway, right? Because keyway is such a role where it's already fragile and we know that there's a lot of layoff happening, you know, in 2023 and QA is a, already a role that is fragile. So when you bring AI into a key organization, people are wondering, like, are you trying to reduce uh, the cost? Are you trying to reduce people? And so my talk was always around, use it as something that's going to help you, you know, and now 2023, we have chat GPD <laughs> out there. Right. And I, I see you talking about it. So, it's, it's happening. We've been telling you guys it's going to happen since maybe 2018. 2023, it's happened. It has happened. So in 2023, how can you leverage AI in any of your role? Not even QA anymore. Everybody needs to look at how they can make their job better. And it's not replacing you. We've already had that conversation so many times. Now it's, and I actually saw something funny last night. I think five serve company they wrote, they wrote an open letter to ai and say let's work together from a human perspective and the and the ai right so that's the conversation let's see how we can use ai and the three low hanging fruit that i knew that it was giving you there's so many tools back in 2016 there was only one or two vendor that was like barely starting with it right now when you go to like a star west conference that everybody maybe last fall or even two falls ago now have like AI, AI in the tool. Now, what level are they giving you? We don't know. You have to do your homework. In my presentation, I tell them what they need to ask based on what they need, you know. But for me, the visual testing is great, you know. 
it can give, do visual testing for you. Um, the the my favorite one is the self healing because I've suffered when I was a QA automation engineer coming back in the middle of the night, uh, you know, or the next day just to fix my my code, you know, to figure out why the test failed, right? Spend the whole afternoon trying to figure that out. So the self healing is something that I personally love. And the, the next one that I really want to even understand a little bit more about it is the test creation part, you know, because we're pushing the boundary. Let's see how far we can go in, in our strategy, right? So if we can create the test for us now and we can refine it with our human eyes or with our human brain based on the requirement, why not? Anything we can do to just be efficient so that as a tester, as a QA person, you can actually do the job that you were hired to do, which is, you know, bring quality to the organization. So you can spend time in those meetings and cross pollinate, you know, and do those integration. The, that, uh, do the boundary test or do the test that nobody think about, you know, those are the, the, the what AI really help you for. I, I love it. And, uh, so I assume you've been using chat GPT. A little um, bit. I'm, I'm, yeah. a, I was skeptical. I'm like, yeah. yeah. I'm a skeptical person. So yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I'm I'm making my daughter try, just play with it, you know. For me, I look at it as a bigger Google, really. And there's a book that I read long, long time ago. I forgot the title, but the book it's a sci-fi book. I was not a fan of the book, but the book really mentioned a lot about this. So for me, I'm like, we are there. And I was in college about 25 years ago, and we were talking about everything that AI can do. And that what hooked me into AI, right? And I feel like now, 25 years later, we are finally there. You know, as of January 2023, we we really close. You know, so I'm really looking forward to the opportunity. I just don't want. I feel like people hype it a little bit way too much. You know, and some of us that are really close to we, we can look at it and see what it can help us do. But I don't, I think we are the marketing is a little bit louder than the actual. You know, what it can do. That's my personal opinion right now. I know you have like, I saw and I, I did sign up for it. I was like, I want to hear what this guy has to say because I have not spent time to actually do the due diligence and see how people can use it. But I'm curious. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, for what I've seen, it's not even, it's only a early version. I, I heard they're coming up with even a more powerful version coming out in a few months. I was pretty impressed what it can do. And like you said, it's almost like a, a, a better Google Yes. And uh, it could do all the things like you mentioned. It could write like a Selenium test for you. Um, it could do all these things for you. But it, like you said, it's not going to replace you because you still need to be able to look at it and say, you review know. Review it. Review it, modify it, right? Uh, so it's just going to help you, I think, do your job uh, better and quicker. Uh, more, be more efficient at, the, at your job. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yes, yeah, so I love how you're, you're saying don't be afraid of it. You need to embrace it, learn it because it is coming. It is here. It, it is, is here. here. Chat GPT, right? So it's like. I, I don't know. I, I was really blown away. I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's nothing, it's a toy. But I, I just really see it as really powerful, getting even more powerful. Yeah, even where I've been paying more attention, interesting, has been marketing, you know. But for some reason, I have a couple of people in marketing in my feed, and they've been, like, talking about it really aggressively, you know. I'm like, okay, I want to know. And everybody should do that exercise. Because that's what got me interested in AI and QA because I knew automation was something that we have to, it's a problem to solve, right? In QA, it has been a problem for the last decade for most teams that have been involved in. So for me, it's, it was in the quest of finding solution. That's how AI was one of the solutions in my toolbox. If there's another one, I'll use it. If it's chat, GPD, I'll use it, you know, anything that I can do to solve for the automation challenge that my team is facing, I'm all for it. I love it. I love your attitude. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Before we go, is there one piece of actual advice you can give to someone to help them with their testing efforts? And what's the best way to find or contact you? Oh, a good advice. I think you just stay curious. That's what I always say, right? Stay curious. And that, that starts with like when you go in the requirement meeting and you're listening to them, don't just think, oh, I'm, I'm just a QA person, so I don't care about the requirement. Yes, you do, you know? Be curious and ask all the right questions because the best QA folks are actually SME for the product. And I've been one in the past, right? You are like the go-to person. I've been in team where there's a new person join and they send it to me and then I train the person based on my test cases because I'm close to everything. 
back to that cross pollination. I'm talking to everybody in the organization, all the different components. So it's the curiosity that drives you to get to that level of like detail and understanding. So stay curious. When you're talking to the developers, stay curious as well. Ask them about the code. Why are they making this decision? Because when you're testing, you need to understand why those, you know, decisions are being made in the algorithm or the way they implement it. So stay curious for me is like a golden rule, right? And that's actually the reason why I love my job because the curiosity makes you want to continue to, to learn. And where to contact me? I think LinkedIn is the best way. I am not a Twitter person. I start to stay away from Twitter. <laughs> But I think LinkedIn is the best way. Thanks again for your automation awesomeness. The links to everything of value we covered in this episode, hand on over to testguild.com forward slash A436. And while you're there, make sure to click on the Try for Free Today link under the exclusive sponsor section to learn all about Sauce Lab's awesome products and services. And if the show has helped you in any way, why not rate it and review it in iTunes? Reviews really help in the rankings of the show, and I read each and every one of them. So that's it for this episode of the Test Guild Automation Podcast. I'm Joe, and my mission is to help you succeed with creating end-to-end, full-stack automation awesomeness. As always, test everything and keep the good. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Test Guild Automation Podcast. Head on over to testguild.com for full show notes amazing blog articles, and online testing conferences. Don't forget to subscribe to the Guild to continue your testing journey.